You know how to intubate safely. You can recite all of the steps to prepare for airway management backwards and forwards. Preparation, pre-oxygenation, pre-treatment, paralysis with induction, protection from hypoxia, placement, and post-intubation management. And that's great. Meticulous preparedness will get you through a majority of intubations. But what do you do when things take a turn for the worse? Airway Master Moves, up next on The Playbook. Welcome to The Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. There are times when something or someone will blindside us. Maybe you're in a stretch of seeing very well visitors to the ED, and no matter what you do, they'll be fine when it hits you. Suddenly, you're faced with a fear-inducing critical presentation. Think back to that time. We've all had that moment of unease or outright fear. What got you through it? Or think back to a time when maybe you were ready and prepared and going to take care of business. It all seemed to go as expected when you're thrown for a loop. And you were left to troubleshoot on the spot and it did not feel good. What is that unseen barrier? What is it that can sneak up on us so stealthily that even if we think we're ready, we end up scrambling? Complacency. It can make the best of us crumble. Now, again, we've all been there, and it's all routine until it isn't. The dread rises like an inky black cloud down from your toes and thickens up into your throat. What can you do to regain control of the situation? I'd like to offer you three just-in-time airway maneuvers that will come in handy when things start to fall apart. The first is the shoulder bump. We know that children have a prominent occiput, and if you place them prone without something under their shoulders, their necks are flexed and their airway is obstructed. Truthfully, this is the most common avoidable issue I see, positioning. With proper positioning, you're already winning. The goal is to align the pharyngeal, the laryngeal, and the tracheal axes. This is something that's pretty intuitive when we're performing procedural sedation. Think of the infant or toddler that you're sedating. If you were just to place her flat on her back, her prominent occiput flexes her neck, it obstructs her airway, and even if it's just ever so slightly, you'll get an end tidal CO2 measurement on her and the read will be like this. A normal breath, followed by jagged, irregular, low-amplitude waves. She's obstructed, even if you can't tell by looking at her with her pudgy little chin and no neck. A low-tech piece of equipment, a towel or bed sheet folded and placed under her scapulae, give you just enough elevation of her thorax in relation to her occiput, and now... Her tragus is in line with her sternal notch, and her waveform shows full amplitude, beautiful, regular waves. Now, we've all been taught this, but we often forget the basics. Remember, the basics are not minor. They're fundamental. All of the advanced techniques in the world may not save you if you don't have proper fundamental technique. With the sick patient, You may have a lot of people doing a lot of things. 
getting an IV, placing a blood pressure cuff, pulling up here, pushing down there. In all of this hustle and bustle, a small child can be a bit of a rag doll on the gurney. And it's very easy to flex that neck, occlude that airway in a sick, uptunded child, and we're distracted. We don't notice it. This is especially important with difficult airways. We have to take what's given to us and make it simple. We have to make it work for us. We have to take our circumstances and create opportunities. You may be lucky. You may get away with no shoulder bump in the easy airways, but some children will fool you. What about children with special needs or syndromes? Perhaps you hadn't noticed it at first. Perhaps it's so normal to the parents or they think it's so obvious that they don't mention it to you. I can't count how many times Parents with children with, say, Down syndrome who tell me that the child has no medical problems. In a way, they may be right. That's just how they were created, unique and beautiful. When I gently confirm that the child has Downs, they nod and agree. Then I ask about the possible complications with Downs. Really, that's the only thing I need to know. Often I just get a blank stare and they say no. Only with a bit more probing, you find out that the child has a typical complication or comorbidity, an endocardial cushion defect, for example, or an ASD or a VSD. Over half of children with Down syndrome have some cardiac lesion. By the way, they also suffer disproportionately from leukemia, testicular cancer, Hirschsprung disease, hypothyroidism, and early dementia, just to name a few. My point here is that to some parents, this is just part of having a child with Down syndrome, which is very true and very logical and valid. We just have to be aware of those complications in case we're going to do something like procedural sedation or rapid sequence intubation. Remember, we're not technicians who just go into a room to perform a task or a procedure without doing the cognitive work first that's needed to avoid disaster. As far as airway considerations go with children with Down syndrome, also called trisomy 21, they tend to have a short neck, a flat face, a disproportionately large tongue, and poor tone. All of that is a setup for airway obstruction, even with small doses of sedating drugs. They also tend to have brachycephaly. Brachy means short, cephaly referring to the head. Other variations of head type that come into play when we talk about difficult airways include children with Crouzon syndrome, also called craniofacial dysostosis. So that's an abnormal formation of the bone due to a mutation in fibroblast activity. These children will have an abnormally shaped head because of premature closure of one or many of their cranial sutures. Each will have a specific term, but let's take the example of dolicocephaly. Dolicos meaning long. In this case, we have premature closure of the sagittal suture. It's the one running on the top of our head. This will elongate the skull, causing dolico, long, cephaly, head. The brain needs to grow, so the head grows longer, in addition to other craniofacial dysostoses. This is germane to airway assessment, because the occipital protuberance that you were expecting in a child is not really very prominent at all. Go back to your basics and make sure that the tragus is in line with the sternal notch, however you get there. Maybe you have to look at this child like you would assess, let's say, an obese adult. You're ramping up the shoulder blades in addition to ramping up the head. 
In the case of obesity, of course, that is mostly to create conditions in which gravity can be your friend and offload redundant tissues to the extent that it's possible. In children with craniofacial abnormalities, you may have to get creative with your ramping or positioning of towels or sheets. Don't worry about what syndrome causes what. Just open the airway, align the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea as much as possible, and luckily, you can always use the tragus and the sternal notch as your guides. Okay, well, maybe the skull seems relatively normal, but you have someone with a congenitally small airway because of a small mouth or jaw or face. What would you do differently if you had to precipitously intubate someone with, say, treacher Collins syndrome and mid-faced hypoplasia? His ears are set back, making tragus to sternal notch different. Uh-oh, what now? treacher Collins syndrome is also called mandibulofacial dysostosis. They have downsloping eyes, mid-face hypoplasia, and a remarkable underdevelopment of the jaw and zygoma, making precipitous airway management very difficult. The signs and symptoms will vary widely. Some people are not even diagnosed until there's a complication. It's a good reminder that hyponathism, a small jaw, can show up anytime and pose a real airway access issue for us. In this case, the sniffing position is still your friend. Whether you're using tragus to sternal notch or the sniffing position, the point is to optimize that particular child's airway in the particular way that you find is the most effortless to oxygenate and ventilate. That may mean small fine tunings or positioning, and that's okay. It may mean that you're giving rescue breaths as needed in various calibrated adjustments and making a mental note of where his airway likes to be. The point here is not to have a geneticist recall of the various syndromes. The point here is that we're here to see anyone, anything, anytime, and that includes all comers, who may or may not have normal airway phenotypes. We may not get a heads up prior. Be vigilant and always think through your backup and spend just a few more seconds to be aware that everyone has a different face and no two people with one syndrome are truly the same. The many-faced patient must be served. Okay, quick story. I attend on the adult and pediatric sides of the ED. Once upon a time, far, far away, I was on the adult side and a resident comes running up to me. Dr. X needs you right away on the ped side. Now, this was a very experienced, excellent clinician. And truthfully, I am just a humble messenger of this story because anything can happen to anyone at any time. And the longer you practice, the longer you realize how awesomeness is measured in resilience and not in absence of failure. Anyway, I run over and see them with some trouble in intubating an obviously not normal child. He looked hypotonic to me and I could see his G-tube, but that's all I knew about him. And often that's all that anyone knows before a sick child drops out of nowhere and into your ED. So they couldn't get the airway. The child was paralyzed and sedated. I had them bag up to get the sats back into the 90s. And I look from my point of view at the foot of the bed, and I see that the child really had no occiput to speak of. It was a fake out. The tragus and sternal notch looked like they were in line. But in reality, that little epiglottis was too anterior for them to see in that position. Now, I'm no better than the next guy, but I did have the advantage of seeing this, and so I just calmly took the shoulder bump out. He didn't need it. We adjusted because we needed to. The point here is that 
even the most experienced of us can make a basic maneuver slip. I just so happened to have the luxury of seeing the whole picture at once and seeing what was not working. The point here, of course, is that the fundamentals are not basic, they're essential. Use the shoulder bump, but always readjust, reassess. Okay, now that your positioning is good, what else can we do to optimize your intubation conditions in a child? The jaw thrust. Remember, we can always hurt someone. And too often, hurting them is a lot easier than helping them. In mask ventilation, smashing the mask into the face will occlude the nasopharynx and occlude the hypopharynx. We've all seen this, a common thing in the heat of the moment. When you see this brute force of smashing the mask into the face, remember that you are a highly trained airway arts master. Combat that brute force with your eagle claw technique. Hook the pads of your fingertips along the thin rim of the child's mandible and pull up into the mask. You're in a position now to open the airway and seal the face up into the mask. In this position, you could actually lift his face and head off the gurney if you really wanted to. The point is that pushing in will occlude, but an eagle claw will pull up into the mask and open up the airway. Also, remember that our relatively big, fleshy fingers can sometimes slip past the rim of the mandible and into the submandibular soft tissues, and we can accidentally occlude the airway that way. So, here is your airway haiku. Airway occlusion. Eagle claw hooks up into. Gentle airway save. Now, this works for bagging, but children have anterior airways, and sometimes just doing a jaw thrust during intubation will be a game changer. If you're now intubating the patient and it's hard to see that anterior airway, have someone, anyone, do a simple jaw thrust up. It's amazing how this aligns the airway for visualization as well. Every nurse and every physician has taken a basic life support class. This is just a BLS maneuver that's often overlooked. The jaw thrust. You can use it in trauma patients, in medical patients. Have your assistant gently grasp the angles of the mandible and pull up. If you're struggling to see that anterior airway when you're trying to intubate, the jaw thrust is your secret weapon. Okay, you've positioned the child well with a shoulder bump. You've gone in, and you've even needed to do the jaw thrust. But still, that airway is elusive. What final master move can you do to get that airway secured? Look up. You may have to change your point of view. Instead of looking down into the anterior airway, you may have to crouch down so that your visual axis is in line with the airway axis. We use the cormac lehane system to grade our view of the larynx. And you may see a grade one view, a beautiful open view. But maybe when you look down, you have a grade two cormac lehane view, a partial view of the glottis. A grade three shows us only the epiglottis, and the dreaded grade four shows us nothing. We don't even see the epiglottis. After a nice shoulder bump and a jaw thrust, you may convert a grade 3 to a grade 1 or, or even a grade 2 to a grade 1. Or you may be blindsided. Despite your shoulder bump, despite your jaw thrust, you are humbled. And you have that moment. You get down on your knees and pray. And you look up. From that vantage point, you can see the very anterior airway, and you change your perspective. Just by crouching down, you see a beautiful view of the arytenoids and vocal cords, and you just cry a little bit on the inside, but not on the outside. So, 
So to summarize, remember, a shoulder bump will align the airway in the majority of cases. If you run into trouble and only see pink, have someone else do a jaw thrust. Everyone who's done a CPR class knows this maneuver, so a nurse, a student, a respiratory therapist, anyone can help you improve your view. And finally, when all else fails, look up. Crouching intubator will find the hidden airway. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.